I'm going to talk about uh, X-ray nanoimaging. How far, how big can we go? Um, which is something we've been thinking about in our group. Uh, okay, so here's the team. Um, you're going to hear from Salgat later on, and um, quite a few of the things I'll talk about have involved Ming and Sajid. Um, uh, and some Pan Pan. Uh, Chao Ling and Shirley are more on biological sample preparation, which I'll talk less about today, and Everett on uh, sort of correlative light and X-ray microscopy, which I won't talk about all about today. Um, I need to give a shameful plug to for my book, if you um, weren't aware of it. Okay, so here's my outline. Um, I'm going to talk about tychography and then how big can we go? The challenges include, you know, what is the resolution that we can achieve and what does that, what do we have to do to get there? Um, what is the coherent flux that we have uh, coming down the line? Um, what do we have to do for speed? Um, what do we have to do for 3D imaging and the number of tilt angles and kind of putting it together, how big can we go? And then I'll sort of segue into um, leading up to Salgat's talk. So of course, I think everyone on this seminar knows all about tychography. Uh, it's really been a wonderful development. In fact, I remember when I first heard at, there was a coherence workshop in um, uh, here in France, um, what was the name of the island, whatever it was. And I heard John Rodenberg's talk and I was kind of puzzled by it at first and didn't kind of connect it very well to what we were doing in coherent diffraction imaging. And it was Franz Pfeiffer, I think, who Bacopal. really noticed that talk. But, oh yeah, Pokoro. Yeah, yes, yes, right. Yeah, and you know it's just really taken off from there. Um, so you all know about that. Um, the way we tend to do it at Argon is by combining it with fluorescence, so that we get both a high resolution transmission image and not quite as high optics limited resolution image with fluorescence. But that lets us do things like this image cells where we can see where trace elements are, as well as see the structure of the cell. And we've also done um, earlier some work, and now that's kind of taken off on its own project on in imaging integrated circuits. And I, um, before it kind of took off to this bigger project, um, here's the early demonstration we did. And I just want to point out that imaging this chip here was done through 300 microns of silicon um, before wafer polishing. And so being able to image you know, a thin chip layer, but through 300 microns of silicon, there's no way you could ever do that with an electron microscope. You know, beam will penetrate that. X-rays, it can penetrate that. And so that got us thinking about how thick a sample can we do and what's involved in the challenges for that. And so that kind of gets into the challenge here. So um, when you uh, want to kind of make uh, estimations, um, you have to have a way of worrying about um, photon noise and contrast. And this is the approach that we use for this. Um, it comes uh, originally from Bob Glazer um, and really from signal processing community, but there are some key early papers that I've listed at the bottom here. Um, and the basic idea is that um, your signal to noise ratio involves calculating your signal and your noise, okay? The signal is the difference in intensities you measure between whether there's a feature there or it's just a background. That's your signal, that difference. So this term right up here. Your noise is um, from square root of the number of photons doing a Gaussian approximation to Poisson distribution. And you have uncorrelated noise in the feature measurement versus the background measurement. And so you add those in a root mean squared fraction. And that gives you this expression on the right here that the signal to noise ratio goes like the square root of the number of photons per pixel, n bar. Um, this intensity difference divided by the square root of the intensity sum. And um, that uh, quantity IF minus IB over square root IF plus IB um, is capital theta, which um, in David Sayer's papers is known as a contrast parameter. It's not quite the same as a fringe visibility, as you can see, um, but it's similar. Um, and then uh, if you want to get, um, well, uh, just simple manipulation of that formula tells you that the number of photons you need per pixel is a signal to noise ratio squared that you want to get. People usually assume five to one as a minimum from the ROSE criterion, which goes to early studies on human imaging, or human vision rather, um, divided by this contrast parameter squared. 
Um, and then, of course, if you want to get more complicated, you include absorption and overlayers and underlayers. And so a much more detailed version of these calculations is given in this paper with Ming Du in 2018 listed at the bottom here. So that includes stuff like uh, multiple scattering and so on. Okay, so I'm going to make an assertion here, which is that all good image methods require the same fluence. That to get a specified resolution, you have to give a fluence um, of photons per area um, required by the intrinsic contrast of the sample. And also, um, Parad's law says that the scattering signal drops off as the fourth power of Q or fourth power of spatial frequency or angle. Um, and so uh, if you're doing it in a tychography experiment or in an imaging experiment where you're collecting the light and phasing it with a lens, in all these cases, a two times improvement in the spatial resolution needs 16 times more fluence. So I assert that you know it's just fluence that, um, if you do everything else right, it's fluence that limits the imaging. Um, lenses collect scattered light and rephase it to yield an image. Um, you can do that, of course, in amplitude contrast, absorption contrast, and in phase contrast. Um, and so, you know, there are examples of doing Zernike phase contrast for full field imaging and scanning microscopy. The reference there is for scanning. Um, but if you're doing a lens downstream of the sample for full field imaging, the efficiency of that lens for soft X-ray zone plates is only about five percent, typically five to ten percent, um, and that. Uh, means you need to use 10 to 20 times more fluence on the sample in order to get the required fluence in the intensity measurement. Um, coherent diffraction imaging has the advantage of using pixel array detectors that are near 100% efficient. Um, and the phasing algorithms really don't introduce, um, as far as we can tell, any extra noise. And so uh, I think there are many examples of uh, computational studies of that, including the one I've listed there. And I maintain that the fluence requirements are the same whether you use Fresnel diffraction in holography or near field tychography, or for Fraunhofer diffraction, far field diffraction for CDI and tychography. Um, and we did a numerical study of that. Um, I think uh, Tim Saldit may feel a little differently about that, but I still maintain this um, statement. And just to give you an example of this, here's some work from Zhenjing Deng where he imaged a test pattern um, multiple times, except with different exposure times per um, uh, tychography illumination spot. And if you look at the curve at the upper right here, this is giving power spectra of the reconstructed images, you can see that you're getting higher and higher spatial frequencies as you increase the dwell time. Um, and it goes roughly as that fourth power scaling. And then a simulation study at the bottom, we have an estimate in that paper of what is the kind of critical fluence for a given contrast of object, which in this case gave us to predict that the fluence would be 350 photons per pixel to see this simulated test object. And then we did reconstructions with a variety of methods. Um, far field tychography is FFP with either a Poisson or the standard least square um, noise model. Um, versus near field tychography versus um, holography. And um, we we found in this uh, simulation study that we had quite similar requirements um, uh, for the exposure and they all worked out well with this kind of critical dose. So again, I claim that fluence determines resolution if you do everything else right. Um, and probably most of the people who have heard um, long ago of this, but uh, there was a paper that came out in 1976 in electron microscopy that made this statement. A three-dimensional reconstruction requires the same integral dose as a conventional two-dimensional micrograph, provided that the level of significance and the resolution are identical. The necessary dose D for one of the K projections in a reconstruction series is therefore the integral dose divided by K. So in other words, if you're trying to detect whether this voxel has a feature or a background material, it doesn't matter whether you bring all the photons in from one direction in one projection image, or if you distribute the photons around all the projection directions. Um, and this was quite a controversial idea, the idea that there's no more dose involved in 3D imaging than 2D imaging when it was first introduced. But you know, now it's really embedded in the practice of single particle electron microscopy, where you're taking many, many images um, of identical objects and combining them 
to get kind of the combined statistics from the um, totality of the measurements and also medical x-ray tomography. So this is now kind of, you know, used routinely in all sorts of cases, um, even if they don't refer back to this original paper. Okay, so with all that, we carried out um, uh, a study where we asked what would be required to image large samples. And so in this, we, we um, decided, okay, we don't know what it, at each thickness of sample, what is the ideal photon energy? What is the fluence required when you include all the overlying absorption and so on? And we did it, you know, if you're gonna do a simple model study, you pick a simple model. So we did basically two samples. One is 20 nanometer copper features in silicon um, with varying silicon thickness. And the other one is um, 20 nanometer protein features in ice. And we actually made the ice kind of cytosol-like with a little bit of protein in it. So those are the two samples that I'm gonna talk about. And this is kind of a complicated plot here. You're gonna see um, another one for biological samples in a second. And so I need to explain this. Um, what's uh, being varied on the x-axis is the photon energy. What's being varied on the y-axis is the overall thickness of the silicon in which we have this little feature that we're trying to image. And then we're showing both a grayscale image and contour lines of the number of photons required per voxel. Um, and so when you see the number six there, that means 10 to the six. And when you see a five, that's 10 to the fifth. So what it's showing you is that for very thin samples, of course, we need only a few tens of thousands of photons to see this object. Um, and that the optimum energy is rather broad between about three and nine kilovolts. Um, but when you get to a thicker sample, you want to increase the energy because you need to penetrate all of this other silicon. <clears throat> and so you'll see there's sort of the optimum is this where there are these cusps of these contours are. So um, for a sample that's like 300 microns thick, your optimum energy would be something like about you know, 13 kilovolts or something like that. And for even thicker, you, you need to go to a higher photon energy. You, and the, the kind of rule of thumb that we um, see in doing this is that um, while this calculation is a much more detailed thing, a good approximation is to say that you're, um, you should choose a photon energy for the thickness such that the mean absorption in the overall material is about one over E um, or 30% you know, transmission. So if you pick about 30% transmission, you're usually gonna be pretty near the optimum photon energy for that sample thickness. So that's what's shown here for silicon. Um, and then if from this plot, we, we go from this whole large array of values for each thickness, we pick out the optimum photon energy and plot it. And we pick out the required um, fluence and plot it. We get this here. We have the fluence, the required number of photons in red. You can see again, it goes from a few thousand um, up to uh, near a million. And the optimum photon energy um, at which the minimum fluence was found is shown in blue. Okay, so again, as you get to a thicker and thicker sample, you should crank up the photon energy. And it also follows approximately this trend of the one over E attenuation length in silicon. And of course you see the silicon K edge in there um, affecting the choice of energy. Okay, if we do that same thing for biological samples, here's the curve for that. We need, it's a little less contrast than copper and silicon, so we need more photons. Um, but again, we follow the um, uh, one over E absorption um, choice for uh, optimum photon energy approximately. And um, we also plugged into this model limiting the dose to 10 to the ninth gray. And so all of these conditions keep the dose below 10 to the ninth gray because that's sort of the point at which you start to see degradation even in a cryo sample. Okay, so we have a estimate then, and, and here's the optimum photon energy and the required number of photons for a, a biological type sample in our simulations. You can see you need a lot of photons because it's a low contrast object. 
So the next question we wanted to ask then is, well, if we need a lot of photons, what, what might we get down the road from these diffraction limited storage rings? Of course, max B4 being the first one of them in operation. And so we've had this wonderful history in recent years, um, going back for decades, in fact, of these very significant gains in um, coherent flux. And so we, we start to get to think about how far can we push things with uh, X-ray nanoimaging in terms of large samples now that we get more and more flux. And of course, XFELs offer even more coherent flux, but because it comes in these very short pulses with a long time in between, you have to worry about um, ablation of the sample. And so usually they use the diffract but destroy type approach. Um, and that's not really compatible with uh, uh, tomographic type imaging because you have to have your sample stick around for another viewing angle. Okay, I'm going to then go and take two example cases, which are the planned upgrades of the APS at Argonne um, at high photon energies and the ALS at Berkeley at low photon energies. We can then calculate the spatially coherent flux from those sources, which is shown here. Um, this is using the, the best undulator of their set at each photon energy. And so it's kind of the best you could get at the best optimized beam line um, in each case at each photon energy. And of course, because coherent flux goes like brightness times lambda squared, um, you get more coherent flux at um, uh, uh, larger lambda at lower photon energies and less coherent flux at smaller lambda at higher photon energies. And that's just how it rolls. Okay, so we can then use that required number of photons per voxel times the number of voxels in the image. Actually, it only goes as n squared, not as n cubed for the time for 3D imaging. I won't get into that, but it's in, written in our paper in Journal of Applied Crystallography. And then you can calculate what is the per pixel time, first of all, um, with the available coherent flux using the optimum energy. So this is going to involve the product of the number of photons that we need here, required photons, and available coherent flux, and then picking out the best product of those two for the, best, for the shortest pixel time. And so if you do this, um, you find that, OK, you get a slight shift in the optimum energy because uh, of the way the coherent flux drops off. Um, and you get a pixel time, which is rather fast for the copper sample. Um, and if you do it for the biological sample, it's uh, still quite fast. So this tells me that you know, we want to be doing very short um, per pixel exposures. And so we really need to push for high frame rate detectors, um, you know, like megahertz range um, frame rate detectors. There are some R&D efforts of that, especially at the FELs. Um, and so we have some hope that this might come down the line, but I think we need these for this kind of imaging at synchrotrons. Okay, so next um, I'll say something brief about detector pixels versus frame rate um, for speed. Um, and so uh, I know there are a couple different ways that people do tachography. There's using bigger co coherent illumination spots. They require more detector pixels um, to work with. And they require more monochromaticity, and they aren't as demanding on the detector frame rate. Um, if you do small coherent illumination spots, you require fewer detector pixels and also less monochromaticity, so you can use a little bit more flux from a um, quasi-monochromatic source. Um, but you do need the higher detector frame rates. And you can show rather easily that the information transfer rate to the detector is the same in each case if you're trying to do the same overall imaging speed. Um, so it's really just uh, what is the information rate you need to get out. And we need to get high information rates out. OK, 3D imaging now. So I've talked so far about you know, kind of standard tychography um, and then saying that dose fractionation works. But now we need to think about the details of 3D imaging. And so, so, of course, we know very well from what's been done, pioneered at the Swiss light source and really operating routinely and beautifully at the Swiss light source, that one very successful way to do 3D imaging with tychography is to do 2D, 2D tychography at each rotation angle and combine those um, 2D images in a standard tomographic reconstruction algorithm to get a 3D image. 
Um, and of course, that's not the only thing they do at the Swiss Light Source these days, but that's kind of how it was pioneered and a very simple way to understand it. However, this only works within a depth of focus limit. And the depth of focus limit goes like the transverse resolution squared over lambda. And so here we have a plot of the depth of field um, in microns on the vertical axis versus the transverse resolution on the horizontal axis. And you can see that you know, for soft x-rays, you have a pretty small depth of field when you're doing high resolution imaging. For harder x-rays, the depth of field gets bigger. But you know, if you're going to talk about doing uh, um, you know, 100 micron samples and your optimum photon energy from an exposure point of view is you know, 10, 12 kilovolts, uh, you've got a problem here. You've got many depths of field. Your sample is going to have out of focus regions. So how do we deal with that? And of course, uh, um, the way conceptually to deal with that in the forward problem was put forward in electron microscopy quite some years ago, this multi-slice method, where you um, treat your sample conceptually as being made up of a bunch of thin slabs. And what you do to model wave propagation through the object is you um, apply the optical modulation of that slab and then do a free space propagation to the position of the next slab. And you can keep doing this over and over again. And it turns out much to our uh, fun, um, uh, it even gives you, uh, it, this reproduces mirror reflectivity phenomena and waveguide effects in X-ray optics. Um, uh, Kane and Lee did a uh, paper on that some years ago. So it, it's a very nice method. And um, again, it's how you have to interpret images in electron microscopy. And of course, then Andrew Maiden and John Rodenberg um, uh, took that over for uh, tychography and said, well, we've got coherent wave fields. We can then um, include objects at several discrete planes and model the propagation of the wave between these planes and image um, these multiple planes in an object in multi-slice tychography. And then it's been uh, demonstrated in the X-ray, first in Japan, and then at Swiss Light Source, and then elsewhere. Um, so there's lots of work now in multi-slice psychography. Um, so uh, when you do that, um, you can ask questions about how many um, projection images do I need to acquire to do successful 3D images? And it's a kind of a surprising result here. Um, if you think about standard, uh, standard tomography, you take a projection image. A projection image means there's no um, variation in the information you get along the depth direction. So you get a pure projection image and it has um, transverse spatial frequency information in Fourier space shown on right, but it has no depth information um, perpendicular to that um, as shown in right. And so when you do standard tomography, you take these um, projection images and you fill in Fourier space um, as shown at lower right here from all these projection images. And um, the Crowther criterion, which tells you that you have complete information filling in Fourier space, is basically the statement that the, um, uh, at the outer edge of Fourier space, the outer radius here, you have no gaps in coverage of information. You filled completely all of Fourier space. Now, of course, you can do um, reconstructions with less than the Crowther criterion information. It works much better in algebraic type reconstruction than it does in Fourier-based reconstruction because the gaps in Fourier um, give you artifacts unless you deal with them somehow. Um, but still, if you really want to measure all the spatial frequencies in the object, the Crowther criterion tells you that the number of tilt angles you need is pi over two times the number of transverse pixels. Well, let's think about what happens in multi-slice tychography. In multi-slice tychography, we're reconstructing several depth planes because of the wave propagation effects from one plane to the next. And so if we say that, well, we get good separation from one plane to the next at one depth of focus, then what we get is shown at lower left, we get you know, a number Na of um, axial depth planes. And then if you look at that representation in Fourier space, well, you don't have just a single projection with no Z information, you have some Z information, as many as the number of planes you measured. And so the volume that you fill in in Fourier space has some extent along the beam direction. 
And then if you want to collect all um, regions in Fourier space without gaps as you rotate the sample, um, it turns out that your Crowther criterion is modified by dividing by the number of axial planes that you reconstruct. And so that's um, how you can think about how many tilts you need. Because if you think about taking million pixel uh, um, uh, transverse images to reconstruct a million um, pixels cubed for an object and had to do a million tilts, that sounds pretty crazy. And you know, it seems unnecessary perhaps, and that's what we get in this calculation. That um, in fact, if you work it out in terms of transverse resolution and the object thickness and the wavelength, the object thickness drops out. <laughs> it's rather amazing um, if you can really do this multi-slice approach. And so the required number of tilts is actually reasonable for even doing kind of million pixel across projection images in, in uh, multi-slice tychography. You need a few thousand tilts, not a million. So that's kind of good news for doing um, 3D imaging of really large objects. OK. So now let's put this all together. We have estimates of the per pixel imaging time. Um, and uh, we have estimates of the coherent flux from the source. If we could do everything right, how long would it take us to image a 3D object? Um, you know, This assumes a 10% efficient beam time, 100% efficient everything else, which of course is not reality. But if we could get as close to that reality, how long would it take us to image a volume of, you know, here's a thousand microns, okay, a millimeter cubed. How long would it take us to image a millimeter cubed if we could do all this right? These calculations tell us that it would be a minute. Okay, this is insane because we need really fast scanning, we need really fast detectors. Um, but, you know, it's a goal we can reach towards. We can try and imagine doing really large objects. Um, and it's it, uh, in these calculations, which are very optimistic. Um, it's plausible. And if we do it for a biological sample, again, it's plausible. We could imagine doing a centimeter cubed in a week. Now that's kind of exciting for things like um, connectomics. You know, if you want to image a whole mouse brain, for example, and see a high enough resolution to distinguish synapses from near misses of uh, um, dendritic processes, um, you want to be able to uh, uh, image a whole brain at you know, 20 nanometer resolution, um, if you could do everything right um, and fully optimize, you might be able to do a whole mouse brain in a week. And if you could do a whole mouse brain in a week, that means in a year, you could do you know, many from many animals with different um, uh, animal models for human neurological conditions, um, different stages of development. You, know, you can really do science if you can do many, many samples. And so, you know, this is exciting for us. It's challenging. We're nowhere near this imaging time today. But in principle, we should be able to get towards something like this. And that's um, uh, uh, what we wanted to understand in this simulation study. OK, so um, then let me end with a few brief comments that lead up to Salgat's talk. Um, so if we can model the imaging process, we can reconstruct the data. That's a statement. Um, and of course, in conventional tomography, we've already done large volume data sets of sort of uh, teravoxel size. Um, that's done with conventional projection tomography with no multi-slice, no tychography at about a half micron resolution. But you know, it can be done. One can deal with these large volumes by parallel processing on supercomputers. Um, and then in tychography, uh, you know, the approach you can use is that if you can make a forward model where from a given guess of the object, you can predict what you would measure and then compare that against your measure and have a cost function, you could do a nonlinear optimization approach to reconstructing the object. And that was done first by Gizar Sakairos and Finup, um, uh, as far as I know, in tychography. Um, then you can include things like Poisson noise models instead of Gaussian noise models for the lower exposures. Um, and you can do it for this beyond depth of focus tychography where you don't sort of do multi-slice and then combine the slices and get a projection, but really just kind of included in the whole problem. That was done in a paper with Mark um, Gillis. And then using it um, with automatic differentiation on supercomputers, 
um, that uh, you're going to hear about in a moment from Salcat. But um, the nice thing is, is there are these packages that are written for um, large data sets um, for uh, calculating your neural network weighting, um, which use uh, reverse mode automatic differentiation. And so Mingdu has, um, and Saugat have a paper on doing that for 3D imaging and their code base. There's another more recent paper kind of describing um, that code base for, which is nicely implemented and parallelized on supercomputers. And so you're going to hear now more about what's meant by automatic differentiation in Salcat's talk. And so this is a good time then for me to end and thank the team and many collaborators. And uh, uh, yeah, and now be able to hand off to Salcat. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and I don't know if you want to do any questions in um, from me first. Yes, thank you, Chris. This is a very inspiring talk. And uh, I would say we can have some time for questions or comments. Uh, before we pass. Um, so Carlos Sato, please. You can unmute yourself, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So uh, just for curiosity, you mentioned what would be the, the, the upper limit, 100% efficient and so on. So I just wanna know, do you have any idea what's the current situation? How far are we from this uh, dream? that you are showing us? At the APS, really far. Um, we're using beam lines that um, tend to have crystal monochromators. So they're providing way too much uh, monochromaticity. We probably only need, uh, um, you know, multi-layer monochromators can provide the required monochromaticity. Um, we're using zone plate optics, which are really inefficient, especially at hard X-ray um, energies. Um, we're probably, in most cases, people are overexposing the sample and not using Poisson noise models. So, you know, today at the APS, where we also don't have that hundredfold gain of brightness, um, it's a, uh, we're, we're, you know, probably, uh, well, we're well off of this curve. <laughs> um, so you'd really need to, I, I think, you know, the, um, what is it, ID 21 at ESRF, where they have a um, very efficient uh, KB mirror pair. Um, and they um, have these kind of fast frame rate uh, detectors that are based on phosphors though, which are not very efficient. But you know, if you could combine that with uh, the nice um, uh, direct detection in silicon, I think that could be a beam line where you could get closer to this, but we're a long ways. I don't have a good number, but probably you know a thousand fold away from this right now. Okay, thank you. Chris, you were mentioning that uh, the detector development is actually crucial here. Mm -hmm. One can imagine of um, building a beam line a little bit more efficient and um, increasing the bandwidth and improving the optics. Uh, but what about the detector? I mean, there are some developments for, for detectors for X fails. How yes. do you see going? Well, you know, X fails are the only people really having the direct need right now to push this. Of course, they have rather big pockets um, compared to uh, kind of individual beam lines, but still, um, you know, LCLS, they talk about eventually getting up to 100 kilohertz and, you know, that they could go to megahertz, but um, it's not been kind of a central place on the roadmap to my understanding. And I really, I'm not 100% sure of what's happening lately at European Nexfell. Um, with their detector developments, um, you know, being able to capture data from every pulse at European XFL would drive you towards megahertz, and LCLS too would drive you towards megahertz. But I don't think there's um, a real well-funded effort on this yet, and so that's why I'm kind of trying to push this a little bit. That this is what we all need, both synchrotrons and XFLs, um, is high frame rate detectors. And by the way. Um, I didn't include a citation here, but um, there's uh, uh, a couple of papers that talk about how to do um, data compression in tachography, um, both in the GPU reconstruction code at the Swiss light source. And then we have one where we talk about doing it on the detector chip. And we're right now in the midst of a study with Fermilab about doing other schemes like PCA based um, compression uh, on the detector chip. And so, 
that is going to be something you also need to minute to you know uh, minimize the demands on your data channels coming out from these detectors yes chris uh, may i ask you to use the the common chat to share any links you think you may be interesting for this community while uh, Sauget talks. So if you want sure. to refer to any other publication or study, that, that will be really appreciated. Uh, you could also uh, send a link to your uh, book. Uh, I don't think there's any, anything wrong with that. So please do. Okay. Yes, we, we, yeah. This is really a, a sharing place. Yeah. So Manuel first and Pablo after. Please, Manuel. Thank you. So thanks, Chris. It was a very good, uh, very great talk and very inspiring indeed to inspiring and also scary i guess um so for i was very curious for the for the um, so you put the example of you know in an ideal world you can get this one millimeter cube with 20 nanometer resolution in tissue what would be the data rate do you notice i mean uh, uh, what would be the data rate needed to achieve that yeah so um where do i uh let me get to the right slide here um, for a biological tissue, for the thicker sample, it's megahertz. And for a thinner sample, it's, you know, 100 megahertz. It's this pixel time here. Now, again, you can play trade-offs. I assumed uh, th this pixel time assumes that a pixel is um, acquired in one frame, which, of course, you really don't need to do. You can get many pixels in one frame. And so that's a it goes into the trade-off of whether you use a bigger spot or a smaller spot. Um, so I think you know there's some uh, wiggle room here, but um, it it does imply sort of getting into this megahertz range of um, frame rates for detectors. I think beyond that, you'd have to do a more specific modeling of a specific experiment to really um, get at that. Does that sort of give you a hint? Yes, I wanted to just uh, clarify. So with megahertz, you would mean like the number of re uh, resolution elements per second. If we reach this speed, then we would be able to do that. Yeah. OK, thanks. For the thickest samples. It's, it's surprisingly smaller than I would have expected somehow. <laughs> but... uh, well, again, if you look at a thinner sample here, we're talking about 100 megahertz. Yeah. OK, good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Pablo is next. Hi. Thank you for the nice talk, Chris. Uh, I have some questions related to high energies. I mean, if I missed in your presentation, you mainly focus around 10 kb. You have discussed also up to 30. And there are these famous papers about crystallography, based on crystallography, that says that coherent imaging, depending on the sample size, it could be much more interesting around 30 to 40 kbs. Uh, could you comment why don't you go there or what do you think expect from coherent imaging and 30 kb from the challenges so um you know as you go to higher energy the, the crystallographers have made the statement that um you know well it goes down to the x-ray refractive index right mm -hmm. the um scattering uh the um phase modulation that produces scattering goes like the um a uh, real part of the refractive index, which tends to drop off as lambda squared, mm -hmm. whereas the absorption goes like the um, absorptive part of the refractive index, which tends to drop off as lambda fourth. And so that tells you you should go to higher and higher energies. But the problem is you still need to get some scattering signal. So even though the scattering um, to uh, absorption ratio gets better, you lose scattering and you need more and more photons, then you just don't have time to get that many photons. You know, mm -hmm. again, the coherent flux drops off like lambda squared. Mm -hmm. So that's if you see this plot in front of you here, it does go out to 30 kilovolts. And you can see that you actually need more and more photons, which takes more and more time. And so it becomes less and less favorable, even though um, if, if I, I don't have it here, but we have dose plots that look quite similar. Um, and what you see is that in these calculations, um, the dose sort of levels off at high energies. As you go up in energy, you don't really gain any more in dose because you need so many more photons. Mm -hmm. So that's how we look at it at higher energy. So to us, the optimum um, is always to be where the absorption in the overall sample is one over E. Um, that's going to be about where you're best. Mm -hmm. 
So, okay. So you always look at the absorption. You don't care that much about the dose because you lose the efficiency because of the scattering power. Right. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Then I, I see next is Saugat. Did you raise your hand? Yeah. Um, I have one question for Chris. Do you know what the failure modes for multi slice tachography are like? Like, what are the scenarios where it doesn't work? That's a good question, and I don't think it's been explored as much as it as it could be yet. So, for example, um, what are the monochromaticity requirements for multi slice? Do you need to be more and more monochromatic? The more and more slices you need to reconstruct, I suspect you do. I, I think it's probably rather easy to show that you do, but I don't know. And maybe someone else who's on the talk um, does know, but that would be one thing. Um, and of course, you know, the more demands you're putting on the reconstruction, the more, less tolerant you are of recovering any other parameters like scan position errors. You know, the, the more you do, the more information you demand from your reconstruction, um, the less you can uh, tolerate uh, refining other parameters. But I, I think it's an underexplored topic. Um, like, do we have any idea how many slices we can reconstruct? Or... I mean, if you talk about slices that are pretty far apart, again, I think probably monochromaticity and also spatial coherence come into play because you need to be able to propagate the wave field between those two planes. And that implies a degree of monochromaticity. Okay, so this is a good idea for a paper, Salga. <laughs> well, I graduated, Chris. <laughs> You're going to have to find out how to grad student. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I don't see any other burning questions. We can still have some more discussion at the end. Uh, so then uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Salgat. And um, yeah, we already said. Uh, Something about you before, uh, you've been working in the Department of Computing and now you are also uh, working at APS, right? In, um, you're, you're taking a new position. Um, um, okay. Let me share yeah. My so, uh, yeah, floor is yours, <laughs> so good. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to talk about, some, like, this is, a big portion of my PhD work where we used uh, automatic differentiation for tachography in first using first and second order reconstruction methods. Um, to, in this talk, first I'm just going to talk about optimization for phase retrieval and tachography, and then try to um, give a good reason for why automatic differentiation is of interest for someone doing tachography or just phase retrieval in general. Then I'm going to talk about what are the challenges when we do phase retrieval with first order algorithms. Um, and then, yeah, uh, some work we did developing a matrix free Levenberg Markworth algorithm for tachography. Uh, okay. So, to start with, uh, and this should be a familiar idea, just uh, um, representing phase retrieval as an optimization problem where you have a complex value signal that you want to reconstruct and that you propagate to maybe far field, near field, detect using a uh, fixed, like fixed weight detector, and you measure real value intensities. So the propagation matrix can be a Fourier transform or um, a near field. Um, the detected intensity measurements are real value. So our optimization problem is um, based on the current guess of the complex signal, we can and based on the forward model, we can calculate a particular expected intensity. And then we can define a metric that calculates the difference between the expected intensity and the actual intensity. And what we want to do is um, find the value of the current guess of the signal that minimizes this metric of interest. Yeah. So this is our optimization problem. Find the value of Z that minimizes some, some metric between the expected um, measurements and the detected measurements and the actual measurements. Uh, yeah. And so one way to do that is um, 
I think Chris mentioned that the Gaussian noise model. So that would be one way to define the metric between the expected intensities and the measured intensities. And then um, here C of Z is a regularizer is constrained something else. Uh, like a very popular way to solve these kinds of optimization problems is through gradient descent, which I assume everyone is familiar with. In the gradient descent, the gradient descent is an iterative minimization method where every step you take is the negative of the gradient direction. So you take steps in negative of the gradient direction with some step size. Um, because this is, uh, because our loss function or our error metric, the distance between the measured and the expected data is a real valued uh, number, but the variables we're optimizing are complex values. We need to use something called a gradient to gradient. Um, in practice, it's like for analytical purposes, if you want to do, if you want to do the derivations, then it's, con it's convenient to take to use this definition of the gradient gradient, where you're taking derivative with respect to the complex conjugate of the variable. But uh, I guess the, the basic idea behind the gradient gradient is that you need, so if you want to solve for the complex variable z, you need to define two variables, either the complex variable z and its complex conjugate, or the real part and the imaginary part of the complex variable. So in, for analytical calculations, this is very convenient. But um, in practice, uh, yeah, we can, as long as we know how to calculate the gradient expressions, we can use either this expression or as we tend to use in like our automatic presentation code, take the derivative with respect to the real and imaginary part of Z. And um, yeah, this is, as I mentioned, this is an iterative method. So this is how you would perform a phase retrieval. Um, and I guess one basic, even a lot of the popular, like really old school phase retrieval algorithms, like the error retrieval, um, the error reduction algorithm can be represented as a gradient minimization, a gradient descent algorithm. Um, hybrid input output is not exactly a gradient descent method. It's more of like a maximum, but a lot of these like approaches can be represented using this kind of optimization framework. So the optimization framework is a fairly general framework and in particular, we are concerned about um, the non-convex optimization problem. We're not going to talk about the convex optimization. Um, again, everyone here is familiar with tachography. Um, so this is this is the example that I'm going to be talking about, where you have focused illumination coming in and hitting like the sample. Um, you have overlapping probe positions, and um, you have the intensities. And you might also have a background term, it's like plus something. Um, and what you want to do in tech in the, so in, with, in particular, I'm going to look at two types of typographic construction problems. One is when we have, uh, when we know what the probe, um, probe profile is, when the, what the elimination looks like when it hits the sample. And then another is when we, don't know what the illumination looks like when it hits the sample. And the second, the second problem is generally called the um, blind tachography problem in the literature. The first problem is referred to as the tachography, and it's an example of something called the Cody diffraction pattern prob um, problem in a general kind of applied mathematics and phase retrieval literature. So this is, this is going to be a, like a problem of interest for the rest of the talk, tachography. Um, okay, so next we're going to talk about automatic differentiation. Well, for typography, what we want to do is, oh, sorry, okay. um, again, minimize the metric, the, the last metric that we, are, that we define to measure the distance between the measured data and the expected data. And this is the Gaussian noise model for the typography particular typographic case in particular. Um, and if you calculate the gradients, then the gradient, like here, uh, the notation is a little bit off, but the, the gradient per proposition comes out to be something like this in the, in the typographic case. 
which is um, this is the gradient with respect to the object and the gradient with respect to the probe. And this is a fairly complicated expression, and it's yeah, not not trivial to calculate. Now, if we want to amend the forward model, then we have to change. Maybe if we want to um, go from like the far field to to near field, then we have to. Then the only way we can do that is we derive these closed form expressions again. If we want to change the loss function and go from Poisson model, Gaussian model to Poisson model or mixed Gaussian Poisson model, or if you want to introduce regularizers, if you want to optimize for new, for like position correction, tilt correction, in this optimization framework, the only way to do that is to recalculate the gradients for all of these different scenarios. And that becomes difficult and tedious pretty fast. And um, yeah, ideally we'd like to avoid that. So then the question is, how can we calculate these gradients automatically and efficiently? Um, the solution, spoiler alert, is automatic. I'm going to argue is automatic differentiation. But the key idea that goes into it is that derivative calculation is a mechanistic process. Whether we were calculating it by hand or, or using a computer for this, the basic um, approach is to repeatedly use the chain rule of differentiation for the derivative calculation. And the chain rule of differentiation is based on this idea of elemental differentiability in that any function we do or define, any comp even complicated loss functions that we define are composed of individual elemental functions that we know how to differentiate. So in this, it, oversimplified example, we have like sine of cosine of x. We know how to take the derivative of x, that's just one. We know how to take the derivative of cosine, that's negative of sine. We know how to calculate the derivative of sine, and that's cosine. So when we want to calculate the derivative of this complex expression, more complex expression, what we do is we use the chain, chain rule of differentiation, and then, um, yeah. If we did it manually, we would calculate the closed form expression for this, for the derivative. But if, if you're using automatic differentiation procedure, without the idea behind automatic differentiation procedure is that you, we do not calculate the closed form expression, but we keep track of these individual derivatives here. And then uh, at each point during the, if first we evaluate this function of interest, and at each point, this intermediate evaluation, we store this value in the memory. And then um, we look, we calculate the derivative, this is called a backward pass. And when we calculate the derivative, we use these stored intermediate values from the forward pass. And we, yeah, calc again, like calculate the derivative stepwise without ever accumulating the closed form expression. This is just completely numerical. Um, and we give, we perform necessary calculations to combine this using chain rule. Um, the, like, on one, like another popular way to calculate derivatives automatically in the computer is by using the uh, finite difference method. In the finite difference method, you, you approximate the derivative versus the big difference between the finite difference method and the automatic differentiation method is that in the automatic differentiation method, you're calculating the exact derivatives. You're not doing any, you're only doing any approximation based on the uh, machine precision. So yeah, this is your, the, the gradient value you obtain is as accurate as you could even with the closed form expression. This is automatic differentiation. Um, this is some historical notes. For the phase retrieval application, there was like, first I thought that the first application was proposed by Jerling and Pinup in 2014, where they actually, in this paper, they, they comment about how automatic differentiation is difficult to use because there are, um, this, there's just no software available for this automatic differentiation. So they actually present like, the entire mathematical framework that you need to set up a basic automatic differentiation procedure. This is in 2014, but 
by 2015 and um, I think TensorFlowverse, even in 2014, there were already some tools like Torch, I think was already there. But in 2015, around 2015, TensorFlow came out and then PyTorch came out and this, we just had this explosion of deep learning methods. So now there are multiple different platforms which perform um, automatic, which can perform automatic differentiation in like high performance computing settings and GPUs and like tensor processing units. So we've had this huge, we had this huge change in landscape between 2014 when this paper came out and then in between 2017, when Yusuf Nasrat published a paper that used TensorFlow for typography. So now suddenly using automatic differentiation is extremely easy. And there are like just tons of tools available that can handle all of this. This was one line of work, but if, like much later, I also found out that there was already some work on using automatic differentiation in the electron typography literature. But in this case, um, the perspective that they used was to describe like this multi-slice electron, multi-slice model as an artificial neural network, which is the same, same idea, which is exactly the same idea as you would use in automatic differentiation. But the, except that you, in this perspective, they called it back propagation. But, the, but because they're pre representing it as an artificial neural network, this becomes a little bit of a limiting perspective. It's like kind of you're focusing on the tree and not on the forest. So this didn't find very kind of wide application, but it was there. So the first paper was by Van der Werk in 2012, as far as I know, and then Kamilov in 2015 as well. Um, Okay, so again, going back to the question of why would we want to use automatic differential of these retrieval? No need to manually derive the gradient expression, which decouples the forward model from the optimization. What I mean by this is that um, we don't need to be thinking about, okay, how exactly are we going to optimize this model when we, when we define the forward model and, and vice versa. So um, if you want to use a second order method, I guess, our optimization technique is just independent of the forward model. This means that um, we can easily change the forward model. We can introduce new optical elements. We can um, change the propagation matrix. We can change the loss function to introduce other noise models. Uh, we can introduce regularizers without having to think about, okay, how do we calculate the derivative of this? Um, for the two very popular regularizers are L, the L1 regularizer that enforces sparsity and the total variation regularizer that enforces smoothness. And if we want to optimize new experimental parameters, again, we do not have to calculate the derivative. Um, so the, I think I want to particularly highlight this paper that uh, this is like Ming put in a lot of work and it's I think it's a very comprehensive paper that we published into, like, um, recently. And uh, yeah, we, like this, this paper showcases all of these applications as I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But uh, yeah, the, like, um, the change now is between 2014 and now is that there are a number of these ML software frameworks that are, that are heavily optimized and can be used directly in CPU, GPUs, TPUs. Um, on top of that, these, the automatic differentiation backends of these frameworks is also developing really fast. So things that are not possible like two years ago are possible now. Um, examples of this could be uh, com combining um, forward models or combining optimization with partial differential equations. These are, there are many avenues that we haven't really explored. And again, this, this field is developing so fast that there's just a lot of things we can explore in the future. The big drawback with the particular kind of automatic differentiation method we talked about, uh, the reverse mode automatic differentiation, the back propagation, is that you need to store all of these intermediate values. So there's like a, a significant increased memory consumption. Uh, so this is the trade-off that we have to think. This, this is the, the big trade-off. 
Um, okay, yeah. So in the first paper that we that I published in this automatic differentiation approach, uh, we looked at automatic differentiation for typography. Uh, before that, Yusuf, uh, Nashid, and Chris, and others had published a paper on KD for typography, but that did um, that was more of a, okay. This that was more of a proof of concept that did not this rigorously like analyze the um, this the application of the AD framework. And in this paper, we did that. We showed that okay, um, the, the derivatives that we calculate are exactly what we expect, and and we also showed that this is very easy to extend to other forward models. Um, the key idea that we use in this paper, and this is the key idea for automatic differentiation in general, is that what we define is the forward model, what we define is the object, the probe, and then we calculate the elimination position, we define how the particle detection works, and then, uh, yeah, we also define the intensities, and we define the error function. This is all we do in the forward model, and the software automatically, like, uses the chain rule of differentiation to calculate the gradients that we need. Uh, this is to showcase that changing the loss function in this case, changing going from the Gaussian noise model to the Poisson noise model is as easy as just changing this expression here. Changing the propagation mode is as easy as changing this expression here. Um, these, ex yeah, this, this is the power of the automatic differentiation approach. And, um, we showed this through a couple of different ways. We use the same basic framework with like very um, small changes in, in the code to also reconstruct near field tachography, probe and, the probe and the object in the near field tachography case. And we also looked at the multi-angle Bragg tachography where now you're reconstructing a 3D structure and not just a 2D structure. And you're looking at the Bragg geometry and not the uh, transmission geometry anymore. This was our paper. And um, up and Ming, like in collaboration with Ming, we also published other papers that looked at uh, beyond depth of focus type of tomography, where, it, where we are combining this near field um, propagation, as Chris talked about, the multi slice final propagation to reconstruct the 3D object. Chris talked about this already. So, but yeah. We show that all of this is possible with like, with only, well, the multi-slice because it's stackography and tomography, this part requires like significant changes in the code. But otherwise, the, the, the basic idea of optimization remains the same in all of these different approaches. Um, and so one thing I mentioned earlier is, I mentioned like uh, that we can arbitrarily change the loss function, that we can change, uh, we can, optimize for new elements in the model, like the um, position, tilt correction. Uh, Ming showed this again really nicely in the paper published recently, where uh, this is the, the test case is multi-distance holography, where um, we introduce errors in, in our simulation, we introduce errors in the hologram distances, and also in the tilt orientation of the um, of the hologram of the detector. Collectively, we can call these affine errors because these errors can be represented with like a single matrix. On top of that, we also introduce short noise, like Poisson noise, into the um, intensity simulated intensities. Um, and okay, so first, what I want to show here is if we look at the reconstructions without any any correction whatsoever, using just the uh, yeah. But, um, if we well, there's no plot with just the with no correction. But if we use only the um, distance correction in, in the z along like the longitudinal distance correction for the hologram, then we our reconstruction is not very good. This is with the LSQ, which is a Gaussian noise model. So this, this reconstruction is not very good in this case. Now, if we um, introduce no like distance and the 
uh, like the tilt correction, then we get a very accurate reconstruction in the noise free case. The highlight here is just that the software can easily reconstruct both the um, can easily incorporate the hologram distances and the orientations for this refinement. Um, on top of that, we also looked at uh, different noise models. Even here, we looked at the difference between the Gaussian noise model and the Poisson noise model. There's no discernible difference in the noise free case, which is what we expect. But there is a difference between um, N here with the fluence. So in this case, there is a difference between just to mention all of all of these reconstructions use um, as a default the affine correction. So in these reconstructions, we are already correcting for both the tilt and for the like the hologram distance. So, and this is just different cases for different fluences, of different noise models, and also with the application of the total variation regularizer. You can see that when you apply the total variation regularizer, the reconstruction is much, um, in this case, it's much better with the Gaussian noise model versus, um, I mean, total variation with the Gaussian noise model is much better than either of the reconstructions without the Gaussian noise model. But the, um, the highlight, the, the main, the key highlight here is that we're using a single modular software framework to do all of this. Um, another thing I mentioned was that AD is HPC ready. This is um, AD frameworks, AD two sets of HPC ready. This was demonstrated by Yusuf in his paper in 2017, where he looked at, um, where he compared between like sync pi, where uh, in this case, what he did was he divided large object into subdomains and then um, used the pi algorithm to reconstruct each of the individual subdomains. Uh, and the sync and the async in this case just uh, refer to how often the, the solutions of each subdomains are synchronized. The async is not, the, in the async case, the solutions are not synchronized. Um, so the, the pi code that Yusuf used for this was uh, very carefully, he spent very long time optimizing this code. And this is very carefully optimized for multi-GPU keys. And um, when he used, when he coded up the equivalent framework using TensorFlow without doing this care, extremely careful um, GPU code, he found that in the TensorFlow reconstruction scaling was actually better than his very careful like, uh, customized code. So it's, there's so much effort that all of these research, these companies, principles from Google, PyTorch and Facebook, that these companies put into their GPU backends or into their HPC backends that are putting in a lot of extra work to try to develop our own code base to do this kind of in GPU and like multi CPU reconstruction is often um, unnecessary and almost suboptimal. This is what this work showed. And you should be very surprised by this. Another perspective for AD now is, uh, or another, um, I guess, use case. Anyway, multi -slice prop in the multi-slice propagation, what we do is we simulate a large number of slices and we don't actually obtain a closed form expression for the forward model, particularly if we have very large number of slices. We just write a program that calculates the um, uh, propagated exit wave at the very end. And this, it just keeps track of the illumination at each slice and prop, you, prop, you propagate slice by slice by slice. This, we write this program. So a forward model is a program. And um, automatic differentiation, by definition, what automatic differentiation is, is, is a way to convert a program that calculates the forward model to a program that calculates the gradient. Now, if we wanted to calculate this by hand, if you wanted to do all of this cost, like um, if you wanted to incorporate this into this, do this optimization by hand, for this case, we 
we cannot derive the closed form expression anyway. So what we eventually end up doing is writing a program to calculate the same thing, um, to, to calculate the gradient, to, to do this backward propagation. And automatic, by definition, automatic differentiation is just a way in which the computer automatically does this. So this is the power of automatic differentiation. And this is also, this is actually the basic idea that makes automatic differentiation so attractive for the neural network case where you might have many different neural, neural, many different layers and you cannot write either the closed form forward model or the closed form gradient model. So all you can do is work in terms of these programs. Um, Another perspective is also that, okay, another argument for the use of automatic differentiation is that if we want modular software, if we want modular framework that addresses a large variety of forward models, solves variables, uh, solves the object and probe variables, as well as um, that can also correct for translation, tilt, rotation angle, et cetera, then one approach would be to write a closed form expression for each of these combinations, which is just completely unrealistic and it is extremely tedious. So if we wanted to write this framework by hand, we would try to think of a modular approach that uses the chain rule intelligently to combine the gradient calculations. And this is exactly what automatic differentiation is. So this is a, another argument for why automatic differentiation is an interesting approach for these yeah. So um, the applications that I showed so far in automatic differentiation for phase of shape, the gradient based phase of shape will all use the first order algorithms in that it only use the gradient information and it did not use any, any higher order derivative information for the um, optimization. This is um, a little bit limited and a little bit difficult because when we do a gradient-based phase retrieval, um, we have to define a step size. So this is the gradient-based phase. This is the very basic steepest descent approach where we use a step size. And we can either analytically calculate the step size, like a conservative choice for the step size, which is called lipschitz Johnson inverse of Lipschitz. And the EPI case, for example, uses this kind of step size, or we can use an accelerated method. Um, this, this, using this conservative choice of the step size, like in the EPI algorithm leads to very slow descent, very slow optimization. So if we want faster optimization, then we have um, some options. One is to use, like, or well, our option is to use an accelerated method. And uh, once we use an accelerated method, in this case, the acceleration method that we're using here is, um, is the is called the momentum method, which is uh, again very popular method in like optimization literature, and particularly in the machine learning literature. In the momentum method, this is much faster, but you introduce an extra parameter, the beta, the beta parameter, on top of the step size. Um, there are other acceleration methods as well, like. The an extremely popular method in the in the optimization literature and the machine learning literature right now is called the Adam Adam optimizer, which also introduces these extra tuning parameters. Uh, the the difficulty now is once we introduce the extra tuning parameters, then we also have to like the optimization becomes very sensitive to the values of these tuning parameters. And even in um, the basic steepest descent case, outside of the, you know, the EPI model, outside of like, once we, once we move towards complex um, forward models, then it becomes harder and harder to define the conservative step size. So even in that case, we have to tune for the step size anyway. Um, so in the end, our reconstruction becomes very, very dependent on these tuning parameters. Um, for example, in our paper, we looked at Pipe Dichrograph with Atom Optimizer, and we found that for uh, for different levels of photon count, the 
ideal values for these step sizes were very different. So one step size that works for like one photon count and one loss function might not work for, in this, in this case, the color scale shows the reconstruction error after 1500 iterations. So a step size here works fine for the photon count, a particular like low photon count, but that would lead to very slow optimization or no optimization at all for larger photon count. So our optimization procedure is dependent on this kind of tuning that we have to do, which is um, difficult and very computationally expensive. And this is a very big challenge, um, like not only in our work, not only in like inverse problem literature, but also in the machine learning literature as well. So in effect, as scientists, we're stuck between like a hard rock that is you know, a slow optimization or a hard place where we, uh, we have to spend a lot of effort trying to optimize specific parameters. Um, so what's the solution? Like how can we achieve fast optimization, fast and robust optimization without doing this kind of tuning? One idea is to use, instead of um, trying to define sophisticated strategies for this kind of tuning, why don't we use some method that produces well-skilled directions? And we can do that by using um, high order derivatives, for, for example, by using the Newton method or quasi Newton method. To, um, to understand what we mean by like high order, like second order methods, we can go back to kind of a very um, a basic picture of even first order optimization. When we do even the first order optimization, what we are doing is First, um, like if we want to optimize, if we want to calculate the step size at a particular point Z for a cost function G, then we approximate that using like, the, the Taylor expansion. The second order Taylor expansion is the second order Taylor expansion. Here we have the zeroth order term, the first order term, and then the second order term, where M is the matrix of second order derivative. Um, now, in this graph here, I'm just looking at a very simple function where G is the original function. And let's say we have no information about the second order derivatives at all. Then we uh, substitute M with the identity matrix. And in this case, we get the approximation that the red curve here. Um, and then when we're cal calculating the descent step at this point for G, what we're doing in effect is calculating a minimization step for this quadratic that we calculate. So in this case, the minimization step would take us here. And that is in fact, the steepest distance step with the step size of one. But that is not optimal because that would not actually lead to the decrease in the original function. It leads to the increase in the original function. So what we have to do is we have to tune this, our approximation, we have to scale this identity matrix appropriately so that we find an appropriate step size that leads to a decrease. This is what we are doing when we're doing a basic first order method, a basic steepest descent approach, is we are approximating our function with a quadratic and we're calculating the scaling of that quadratic of scaling that um, gives us a descending direction. Now, what if we replace, what if we use the exact second order approximation, a second order matrix of derivatives, which is the Hessian? Um, and that step is called the Newton's method. And as we can see, the Newton's method is well scaled in that it takes us to a decrease in direction without doing any further tweaking. This is just a natural output of the um, natural output of our Taylor expansion. So we don't have to do any further tweaking here. But Newton's method is also a little bit limited sometimes um, when we're working with non-complex functions. And because the Hessian matrix is not always um, with 
is not always positive semi-definite or if our function is not um, convex, if we have like some kind of feature like this, then the Newton's, if we start here, the Newton's method might take us in the increasing direction to the closest, like um, closest sorry, minima or maxima, the closest critical point of the, of the quadratic approximation of this one. So this is not desirable. One, approx uh, one solution to this is to use the gauss newton matrix, which is a positive, which is like a convex approximation of Newton's matrix or convex approximation of the Newton's method. Um, in, in the literature originally, the gauss newton method only applies for uh, like least square optimization problems like with the gauss noise model, but we generalize this a little bit further to apply for any noise models. Um, then, then the question that comes up as well is the Newton's method, the second order methods can produce uh, well-skilled directions without doing any further tweaking. Why don't we just use it all the time? The problem is that the matrix M is an N by N matrix containing second order differentials. So to calculate this matrix and to store this matrix, we have the number of calculations on the storage requirement grow quadratically. Uh, in from one perspective, accelerated first order methods can actually be interpreted as attempts to approximate this matrix, of approximate the Hessian without actually calculating the Hessian, that actually calculating this n squared terms. And this is just for small scale optimization problems, people, people use these second order methods all the time because at that point, um, it's a perfectly reasonable approach. If we have 10 variables to optimize for, then we have to get 100 like 100 elements in the matrix, which is fine. But once we go into any any like large scale matrix, this becomes complete, completely unreasonable. So the solution to this that we're, we're saying is a class of methods called the matrix free methods, which is fairly new in the literature. Where the idea is that instead of calculating the full matrix of second order derivatives, we, we, we use we substitute that with a function that calculates the mat a matrix vector product without calculating the full matrix. What does that mean? Um, for, in the gauss newton method, this is the optimization step we take in the gauss newton method where the gradient G is the gauss newton matrix and P is the step that we calculate. So we would calculate this matrix and we'd calculate the inverse of this matrix and we multiply that with the vector. Um, if, if we just multiply on both sides by, by G, we get this linear system. Um, and for this linear system, we, there exists a lot of methods like um, con the conjugate, the standard conjugate gradient method or the GMRES method, which can calculate this vector, this desired step size P without inverting this matrix. Not only that, if we have a method to calculate this matrix vector product directly without ever calculating the full matrix itself, then we can still use the conjugate gradient method or the GMRES method to calculate this, this update direction. And, and that, that would be a matrix free optimization method. And it turns out we can actually calculate, particularly in the Gauss-Newton matrix case, we can actually calculate um, this matrix vector product using existing reverse mode AD methods like TensorFlow, PyTorch, without ever calculating this full matrix. And so that the computational and memory costs are only about four times that of the gradient calculation. Um, while the Gauss-Newton method is fairly powerful by itself, the Levenberg-Markov method is that we that we look at as an improvement over the basic Gauss-Newton method in that it is more robust. And uh, the Levenberg-Markov method is actually one of the go-to algorithms for small-scale linear optimization problems, or like small-scale nonlinear optimization problems. Um, okay, if you look at optimization softwares, the curve fitting software, and what's what that? 
origin, if you look at the main pack and MATLAB, uh, SciPy optimized, the Levenberg Markov algorithm is typically one of the options that you'll find there. Um, but the, generally, the Levenberg Markov method is only applicable for this kind of least square problems where um, you have uh, like the difference between expected and measured data and square. But this is not uh, the general, this like the Poisson noise model, for example, does not look like this. Um, it, well, we found out that there, there, there was a recent like crowd up in 2000, we proposed a method called the generalized gauss newton method, which um, extends this gauss newton method to general noise models, to general like error metrics instead of the least square model. On top of that, um, I, I will mention this briefly, but for the blind tachography case in particular, when we want to solve a book of proof on the object, we would we ideally want to apply additional constraints that um, limit the solution space so that we can reverse the plane solution. And if you want to obtain, if you want to apply constraints, one way is to use projected PBM method. And we can actually incorporate this kind of constraint optimization within this Levenberg Markov method as well. So in this approach, what we did was we combined um, in our paper, we combined the projected gradient method and the generalized Galton method to, make, to develop a more general matrix for Levenberg Markov approach. Uh, again, going back to our original problem, we, we were interested in typography, where in the paper that this paper recently accepted that Optics Express, so it's going to be coming out soon. Uh, we looked at different noise models and we looked at the standard object retrieval problem and the blind tachography problem. And uh, one of the things that we were interested in was also, okay, what's, what's a good second order optimization strategy in that do we alternate between updating the probe and the object like we do in EPI? Or do we calculate the proof and the object updates together at the same step? We call this alternating and joint optimization. Um, so for the object retrieval alone, when we are not retrieving the proof, we compare uh, the Levenberg Markov performance with uh, uh, some of the um, state of the art methods in the literature. One is Nistrup's accelerated gradient or Nistrup's momentum method. Are uh, the, the, the precondition non-linear conjugate gradient method. And what we see is that if we look at the number of iterations we need to for convergence, we see that the second order method converges much, much faster. And this is um, sh showing super, what's called superlinear convergence compared to the first order methods. This is the expected result. This is what we expect by um, the, but the, but our, the important limitation, the reason why we are not using second order methods in the first place was that the actual computational cost, the actual computation required calculating these huge matrices, might, would require calculating these huge matrices. So the actual computational costs in terms of plots would ordinarily be much, much higher per step than a first order method. But in this case, with our matrix free method, we found that um, the living by Markov method had a computational cost comparable to or like better than this is the this is the actual computational cost required to reach convergence. So uh, the number of iterations is different for each method, but we we're calculating the actual computational cost required to reach the solution. And the computational cost required to reach the solution is actually as good or even better as first order methods. Um, and this is for the object retrieval case with the Gaussian noise model. In this case, actually, the Mr. Uh, like momentum method and the conjugate gradient method also perform really well. But the limitation of the, uh, the nonlinear conjugate gradient method is that the nonlinear conjugate gradient method is very difficult to adapt for constraint optimization. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of any popular adaptations of the conjugate gradient method for constraint optimization. For, for like con optimization with constraints. Um, while there exist 
constrained grid, like um, constrained optimization adaptations of the natural axial grid gradient of natural momentum method. This can require a lot of step size tuning, or we have to use the Lipschitz constant for the step size, which is difficult to calculate. So when we do the, when we look at the blind tachography case, we don't look at, we exclude the conjugate gradient and the uh, momentum method from our comparison because neither are uh, like easy, either easy to adapt or get the, in the conjugate gradient case, they're not guaranteed convergent for the blind tachography. So what we compare our method against is um, the ADMM method which was published by um, like Stefano Matrizzini and others in 2018. The, the Phoebe method, which was uh, published in 2015. And then both of these methods are guaranteed, have guaranteed convergence for the blind tachography case. And we also compare this against the EPI method, um, just because the EPI method is still popular to use in literature. Uh, we found out that one, one interesting result here is that in the EPI method, if we don't apply any constraints, um, even with constraints, I don't really know if the EPI method has been proven to be convergent for the blind tachography case. But if we don't apply any constraints, the EPI method is not convergent for the low SNR case. We have like a very low fo incoming photon count. Um, and in this case, um, the, if we apply the nonlinear conjugate gradient method again, that would also not converge without the use of constraints in this case. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, the, the result here was that for the blind tachography case in particular, the Linda Markov algorithm with our constrained adaptation performed extremely well particularly when we optimize the probe and object together instead of, instead of alternating between the probe and the object optimization. Uh, interestingly, the ADMM method was very difficult. To, the ADMM method actually requires a lot of tuning. There's a penalty parameter that we need to tune carefully. And it turns out the ADMM penalty parameter was very difficult to tune for the um, low, low SNR, the highly noisy case. So it is, very likely that our tuned EDMM parameter is not the optimal EDMM parameter, but that this is just difficult to tune. So yeah, in general, for the lower SNR case in particular, we found that the Levenberg markov method computation cost under robustness was much better than um, the state of the art methods for the blind tachography application. This is the Gaussian mode model. The Poisson noise model it turns out is much more difficult to solve with um, general second order solutions and not just the Gauss Newton, not just the generalized Gauss Newton, but also with the basic Newton's method. The Poisson optimal model is just very difficult to solve. Um, but interestingly, the conjugate gradient method actually performs really well for the, the other first order methods do not perform very well. Even like the ADMM method, I'll show you this in the slide, does not perform very well for the Poisson noise model. But the nonlinear conjugate gradient method performs really well, and I'm not really sure why. Anyway, since the basic uh, Poisson noise model was difficult to solve uh, and very computationally expensive, in this case, PLM and LM show the preconditioned and uh, um, without preconditioning, the Markov method, and the computational cost for these is extremely high. Uh, so what we did instead was we uh, uh, designed the surrogate formulation for the Poisson noise model, where we stabilize the Poisson noise model using this extra term, which we um, drive to zero as we proceed with optimization. So after maybe 50 iterations, our solution, our noise model that we're optimizing, our surrogate is exactly the Poisson noise model, but just a small change in like the early iterations of optimization is enough to decrease our computational cost to completely unreasonable compared to the uh, nonlinear conjugate gradient method to um, to put comparable or slight or somewhat higher. So our, our sort of so Levenberg Markov method with surrogate Poisson formulation works for the object retrieval case, and it also works fairly well 
for the uh, blind tachography case as well. Again, this in this case, the FIV method was not designed. The FIV method in particular that I mentioned earlier used Lipschitz constants for the step sizes. And I don't really know what the Lipschitz constants for the Poisson Mohs model are. So we didn't use the Lipschitz constant here. And that was the reason we also didn't compare the Nestor momentum method in an earlier slide. For the ADMM method, um, yeah, Stefano and co-authors, they derived the actual step, like analytically calculated the actual step size that they would need actual steps that you take at every step. And we're using their derivation, the exact expression. But again, we found that for the low SNR case, the ADM method was difficult to tune and not, was very difficult to tune and very computationally expensive. Um, but for the high SNR case, the Poisson node model is again, the ADM method and the LM method perform comparably, um, have, similar computational costs. Um, but the difference, the big difference is that for the limited Markov method, we don't need to do any, we don't need to do the extensive parameter tuning that we need with the ADM method. So in this paper, what we basically showed is that we can use um, the secondary order algorithm for reverse general phase retrieval with minimum parameter tuning. And in particular for the Gaussian noise model, the rate of convergence is really high. The Poisson noise model is harder to optimize. Um, more general takeaway is that matrix free second order optimization is a viable approach. And this was a fast developing field. Um, so this, there's a lot of work being done in this application. And uh, I mean, even when we consider the, the, the optimization literature and the machine literature, the work that we did with the Levin Markov method is it's pretty much the state of art in, in the general literature. But the, this is a fast moving field and um, matrix free second order optimization that is being developed pretty fast. So maybe, in, maybe there will be new developments that will also allow the application of, um, okay, I didn't, what I didn't mention is that the main limitation of this method that we talked about so far, all of the methods that we've compared so far is that except the EFI method, is that these are all uh, batch minimization methods and that they use the entire data set at once. But for large enough data sets, we can't do that. We have to use smaller chunks of the data set so that it fits in the memory. And we can't use the Levin Markov method or the nonlinear continuity algorithm method or the ADM method for that application. Um, but again, this is a fast moving field which is being developed. And there are a number of upcoming, up and coming mini batch second order optimization approaches as well. And uh, there are, we can also extend this to apply regularizers or other extensions by proximal operators, but we haven't done that in the current work. Just as an aside, I also want to mention that the basic error reduction approach is a limited version of the projected gradient method that um, that we have incorporated in the Levinberg Markov method. So if we wanted to accelerate the error reduction method in CDI phase retrieval, one, one thing we can do is we can, we can, instead of using a fixed step size, we can just actually tune the step size per um, user line search for the step size, which would make it the actual projected gradient method. Just that would significantly accelerate the basic error reduction approach. And then we can if we use the Levin Markov method for that. That would that would be like a much more significant acceleration. However, despite all of these advances, the big challenge that we are still facing is that phase retrieval is a non-convex optimization problem. So even if we use Levin Markov method, even if we use the um, EPI method, even if we use um, conjugate gradient method. We generally only tend to go to the nearest minimum and not necessarily the global minimum. So if we start from here, this is a paper by Stefano Padme. If we start at different positions, we might end up in different minima, different local minima, not all of which are the true solutions to the problem. Um, and there are workarounds that exist. For example, the hybrid input output method is a popular workaround for um, the basic um, CDI phase retrieval case. 
but they're not the same robust and they're also not guaranteed to get us to the true minimum anyway. So even with all of these advances, we are still nowhere close to actually solving the case retrieval problem. Um, yeah. So, okay. That was presentation from my work. Uh, and I just want to mention some other things that related to AD and as Chris mentioned, we have the APS and the SIRF upgrades coming up, which, which will give us a lot more coherence flux and which um, will allow a lot more higher resolution or data flow for existing experiments. So that will enable, like we expect that to enable a lot of new physics. Um, and in, in particular though, AD method comes into play here where we can with using new we can actually use ad methods to also incorporate homology equations for example into the basic um, into our optimization framework to solve for maybe instead of multi-slice maybe there might be scenarios where actually solving for the homology equations might produce a faster or better solution that that's certainly worth exploring and with the ad method we can incorporate that um, for the beyond that, the focus case for or um, for general dynamic diffraction case for materials interfaces, we might want to solve instead of just using the um, projection approximation, we might want to use a dynamic diffraction and to solve the Takagi token equations. In that case, again, there is some we're doing some work with um, with some APS people like Tao Zhu and Ross and uh, Martin Holt. We're using automatic differentiation to directly solve for the Takagi token equations instead of um, use the projection approximation for the, the BCDI diffraction. And hopefully, we're hoping that you know, incorporating ET in these ways will allow us to robustly solve, like beyond that, the focus imaging, materials interfaces. Another application of AD. AD could also be to incorporate prior information. As I mentioned, uh, Ming showed, like Ming has incorporated total variation. He's also used something called the deep imaging prior in, in some of the paper. But these become easier to incorporate using automatic differentiation. But there's also still a lot more work required in like actually finding which prior is appropriate and how to tune these priors. Um, Hopefully in the future, we can use some of these methods to also re reliably achieve the global minimum to actually solve the phase retrieval problem. I'm not really sure what the approach that could be. And a different line of work that also combines this automatic differentiation with uh, phase retrieval approaches is also the machine learning based approaches where we can either use machine learning as, one approach is to use machine learning as a supplement for physics based noise models and that we, we might use machine learning to regularize the physics based noise models, or we might use machine machine learning models like um, to define some kind of natural imaging prior. Um, in this case, we would be kind of, uh, we would have to find ways to combine the, the deep neural network and the physics based power model. And this is very convenient to do with the automatic differentiation approach. Further on, we might even be able to develop end-to-end -end deep learning methods using like physics-based approximants. Um, and from the APS, I know that Matt Schroeder has published a couple of papers doing this in the typography case and the BCDI case as well. But again, in this case, one thing you might we might be interested in is using deep learning model to find an approximate solution and then doing physics-based refinement. Again. Okay. AD is a natural way to combine these approaches. And further on, if we want to do experimental automation, if we want to use like, um, if we want, yeah, experimental automation that tries to, to try to automatically find the, the spots in the typography scan where we need more scan points versus less scan points, and then we might want to use Gaussian processes or deep learning methods where again, but like relying on automatic differentiation is the easiest way to implement this. By the way, the, this is a very fast moving field and the future is bright, just like our coherent process.
Um, yeah, and just I want, yeah, I want to thank my PhD advisor, Stefan, Chris, and Yusuf was also involved with the PhD project for a while. Collaborators, Mark Allen has been a very important collaborator. Um, again, Sid has also, Sid and Ming have also been very important collaborators for me. Other collaborators, Matthew, Ross, Dora, Argon, lab members, Jacobson lab, and all. Um, okay. Yep. Um, any questions? Yes. Thank you so much, Sagat, for this talk. Uh, is, uh, are there questions from the audience? Please raise your hand or unmute yourself, or you can write it in the chat if you prefer. I, I, I think you've been in the field maybe not long enough, but uh, th there is, uh, uh, let's say, the complexity for phase retrieval yeah. algorithm uh, is actually, uh, in my opinion, hindering a little bit the um, uh, the number of, you know, the, the expansion of this method in a large community. So yeah. um, my feeling from your uh, from your talk is that this is an effort to actually make it this more generic and more robust yeah. so that people can actually uh, use it a little bit more blind. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So what is, what is your feeling? Do you, is it actually going to uh, help people approaching? Uh, do you think that there is, a, there is a hope to make this retrieval algorithm so robust that actually uh, one needs less? Um, that, that is that, that is the hope that we can just inject. We can just give a phase retrieval problem to an algorithm and that will step out, spit out the solution. Um, like that, that is the hope, and that is something that we're in the EPS, for example. That is something that we're trying to work towards, either using new algorithms or by also using like deep learning approaches. Um, so, I think second order, like second order methods, is. I, um, is one way forward for that. An alternative would also be to kind of automate the hyperparameter tuning search within algorithm framework. But typically that requires a lot more computation than the second order method. So yeah, I, I hopefully this this kind of approach will become I'm hoping that this will become like a standard part of a more of a bigger package that can robustly solves the problem. But I don't think we're anywhere there yet. So this would be just one component of that kind of approach. Sure. Is there any of the other people uh, in this audience have any comment about this and how, how easy it's actually to... Uh, uh -huh. One, one thing I just want to quickly mention one thing is that um, I, I would recommend, like, interested people, I would recommend people looking at Ming's paper, the, the software paper that we mentioned, and Chris might have shared the link to that, because that actually makes this um, the, the generic approach that we talked about that really highlights that kind of a generic approach where it's all the child correction, everything. Okay. I think okay. Manuel has a question. Yes, Manuel, please. Thanks, Agat, for the presentation. I was a bit, uh, well, I had one quick comment, uh, in particular when you mentioned that there is no cl closed form solution for the multi slice uh, mm -hmm. gradient. Yeah. And there, I, well, I think the, the definition of closed form, maybe we have a different uh, definition, but uh, there is a, at least an analytical solution for it that is okay. just as closed form as the normal gradient of without of the single slice, for example which does rely back propagation slice by slice, et cetera. But uh, yeah. just to say as a comment that there is, there is, and you actually, normally, you know, when these gradients, when you compute them and when you calculate them analytically, you also learn a little bit of what parameters influence the back propagation of the error or the difference into the next step of the solution. So there is a bit of value, but yeah. of course, in, in this, uh, the calculation of the gradients for the multi-slice was very long and painful and you know we got it wrong a couple of times it's, I mean so there is a lot of value of automatic differentiation and I think not only for typography also for other yeah. other other yeah. tomography and many other 
when the forward model becomes complicated, then you have to start from scratch to calculate this gradient. This yeah. is very tedious. So I think yeah. there is a lot of value. And my question was, uh, for the most part, I think you had used your approach in the in numerical simulation, right, to study the the yeah. topology of the error and how different algorithms behave. But did you get a chance to to try it in with real data and uh, um, again, uh, and, so. And, I would look in the, the paper I mentioned with uh, Chris and Ming that we published recently. It actually looks in, at the experimental data as well. That was like this lots of experimental data. So um, I don't know, Chris, do you have a link to that paper? No. But we can share a link I, to that I, paper. That, that actually looks at all of that. Yeah. I'll, I'll paste a link in the chat. Mm -hmm. And my second part of the question was, are these methods already in use in APS, or is this something that will is planned for the near future now that you are joining um, APS? I, I think it's in plan. I think that's part of um, So it's not, as far as I know, it's not incorporated into the normal workflow in APS. So this is still kind of a research approach. For example, um, I think, Again, I'm going to be doing a postdoc at APS soon, and I'm I'm going to be working with Matthew Shirokar, who's in the APS Computational Science Division. Now, um, so and yeah, so like, I guess part of the reason why I'm going to be involved is to try to incorporate this into normal day-to-day -day work. Um, so the like, Ming was working there quite up to very recently, and he was much more involved on the research side, again, using this kind of method. Um, similarly, there are also other people like in CNN, there is Chao Zhu, who's an um, assistant stat scientist now, who's been looking into using automatic differentiation for to solve like takagi tobin equations. Uh, so there's a lot of different branches of research work going on, but I don't think this has been like, fully incorporated in the day-to-day -day workings of APS yet. Yeah, thanks. Oh, thank you. I don't see any other uh, raised hands. Uh, please stop now. Uh, I think we've been now a couple of hours together. It's maybe time to wrap up. Uh, I thank again Chris and Sagat for the uh, presentation today and everybody for being here so long. Uh, I think that there was a request also from uh, Viva Stolp, if you can share this the slides, uh, but uh, I mean, maybe we were, you could also put, get in touch with Sagat. Yeah, I can, I can share the slides. Yes, through me as well. So if there is any way I can be of a bridge within the community, within this, then, then I'll be happy to, to serve. So again, thanks everyone. And uh, well, see you after the summer. <laughs>